Wow, I'm so excited to be here. My name is Jackie Beban Roth, and I'm here to talk to you about the art of the story. And before I begin, I just want to take a moment and thank uh, Jeff Finley, Go Media, uh, Joseph Hughes, uh, Ted Galman, and all the amazing, talented people who have put a lot of hard work into pulling this event together for us. And I don't know about you, but I've been having a great time, and this is something that is very inspirational and necessary for me. And personally and professionally. So um, just a quick round of applause for uh, the media. So I came to this event last year and I um, came on a whim and I was just here for about four hours and I started at Happy Dog and I had some tater tots, listened to some death metal and then I walked down the street and I saw a break dancing competition and then I wandered into the auditorium and I sat here for three hours and I left so inspired. I went home and just wrote and wrote and wrote for a couple hours just to kind of take everything I learned and, and, and get it out of my system. And I've learned a lot. I've used it a lot since. So um, I thought to myself, you know, who's putting this type of event on? I really want to start working with these people personally. So a couple weeks went by and I contacted Jeff. I looked him up and I said, hey man, um, I'm a copywriter and I noticed that you don't have any copywriters on your staff. So if you have a need for any messaging or anything, give me a call. I love working with like-minded people, specifically people like yourself who are so inspiring to the creative community. And what do you know, he emailed me back like two days later and he was like, hey, yeah, actually we have a couple of things going on and we think that you can help us. So since then I've had a great working relationship with them and they've given me some projects and I've given them some projects. And, and let me just tell you, they are as amazing and talented and genuine and humble as they seem to be. So um, Go Media is just a great group of people. Uh, so getting to the point here, um, if you want to tweet about this event, I do not have a Twitter account, uh, but you can hashtag Art of Story. When Jeff asked me to be a speaker a couple months ago, I was thrilled. I was like, oh, okay, thank you. I'm so honored to be sharing the stage with such a great group of people. And uh, then my next thought was, oh my God, what am I going to talk about? Um, I assume for the most part that we have a lot of designers in the room, some musicians, and I'm going to, I have a 14 year career in agency life, I now have my own business, so I'm going to speak from agency perspective. But every, some of the things that I'm saying apply to all different genres of creativity. Um, I chose storytelling because it's not just a topic that we can relate to personally, whether we're sitting at happy hour with friends telling stories about our day, or if we're sitting in a presentation telling an anecdote to support a rationale for our logo design, I think that it plays a role in our personal and professional life. And so what I'm gonna talk about a little today is a formula and three techniques that you can use to strengthen your storytelling abilities to help you engage uh, your audiences and convince them to buy what you're selling, your idea, your concept, your logo, your whatever you're selling, storytelling can help sell it. And it can also help elevate the value uh, perception of that thing. So um, I'm a copywriter, as I mentioned, and I write to sell. So I take storytelling techniques from novelists, from screenwriters, from journalists, and I apply them into a sales uh, messaging methodology that really has worked for me consistently over the last few years. I was happy to see that um, when I was looking through some of the bios and the interviews of other speakers online that there was a, a common theme of storytelling in some of the answers on the interviews. And this was one, this was an answer uh, from Jen Myers that uh, was all about um, obviously what, what does, role does music play in your life? And she said that she gravitates towards music with narrative and character threads. And this is a really important point I want to make. Um, if you think about what, what music you love that you listen to year after year after year, and then the music you just sort of like at first and you listen to maybe for a season and then it sort of goes off into that playlist on the side, that music that classic great music has a story behind it, whether that story is told in different harmonies that you might pick up new every single year you listen to it, or if that music has lyrics that are interpreted different, differently at each different phase of your life. 
Um, so there's a couple of different bands that do that for me. Um, Radiohead, Pixies, and things. I've just been listening to them for years and years and years. And then the good stuff I just sort of put away and, and I come back to. And the reason that I, I wanted to talk about that specifically is because it relates to this good to great scale. Um, back when I was a uh, creative director at a few agencies, I used this scale again and again to help uh, my creative teams better understand how depth of story can elevate the value of what they're doing. So starting at the, the good side, you'll see that um, something, creating something that looks cool is, is good. And you, you show it to a client or to your internal team, and you're like, check this out. Doesn't it look cool? Well, absolutely. Just like those bands that you might hear and listen to for a season, it's kind of cool. I like it. But then it's, it's not sustainable. It kind of goes away for a while. So anybody can create something that looks cool, anybody with a shred of talent. Um, but that's not good enough today. So I put this next benchmark in, wins awards, uh, because we can associate sort of good work with award-winning work in some cases. And if you go to some of those awards shows like AIGA or um, the Addies, for example, a lot of times they'll choose good work that has a clever twist to it. So that clever twist comes in the form of a clever use of pattern, a clever use of medium, a clever use of headline. And it's got another layer of story to it. But really, the great work, the work that moves mountains and compels people to do something, whether that's purchase something, or if it's to take action on a cause, really strikes an emotive chord with people. It resonates through and through. And that's true with any kind of art, whether it's music, fine art, or commercial art. It really makes a difference when you have layers and layers of meaning pushed behind that work to help it really make a difference in someone's mindset. And oftentimes, and I put these little uh, dollar signs underneath here to show um, that also happens to garner more money at the end of the day. Not only does it create a sustainable type of work um, that has long-term staying power, it also um, makes people want to pay more for it. So here's the heart of this conversation today. This is what I'm calling the um, secret sauce formula. Hollywood screenwriters use this a lot for blockbuster movies. Best-selling authors use this a lot. And I'm going to explain it in three easy steps. Here it is. One is a journey that a hero takes um, to move forward in something. Two is a transformation, where the hero then has to go through a series of obstacles to get to where they're going. So they're, they leave on this journey, they go through this transformation, and then finally, at the star place, they return to share what they've learned through their journey with other people. So uh, we're going to apply this in a couple different scenarios in the next 10 or 15 minutes. So journey, transformation, return, and then sharing what you've learned. Who has applied this successfully? These guys. <laughs> and I was looking around yesterday when I was here and I'm thinking, oh, should I even use this reference? Some people might not even know who these people are. <laughs> this movie was made in 1989. Um, and so if you're aware of Bill and Ted and their excellent adventure, you know that they were in a comfort zone. They stepped out of that comfort zone, they had an adventure, they ran into a number of obstacles, they came back, and they returned to their people and shared what they learned um, in a way that, was, that helped them gain more credibility with their audiences. Who else has used this formula? This guy? <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, I didn't get to hear him speak last night, and, and I'm sorry to hear that, be or I'm sorry about that because I heard he was great. Uh, what I want to talk about, particularly with Johnny Cupcakes, is if you go to JohnnyCupcakes.com, you can immediately access his story through the main navigation. So you click on uh, story, and then that opens up sort of like fi a 15-page slideshow that walks you through his transformative journey to get to where he was. And why is this important? 
Because first and foremost, Johnny Cupcakes started out by creating something that looked cool. It was good enough that people wanted to buy it. But in order to elevate his price points and create something sustainable, he had to layer meaning underneath that through the decisions that he made over time. And so now he returns yesterday, as a matter of fact, and probably, you know, I understand he speaks publicly a lot to share what he's learned in his transformative journey with other people. And as a result, he has gone from stepping out of his comfort zone to take that journey by selling t-shirts out of the trunk of his car to a multi-million dollar business where this logo is not just something that looks cool, but it also has a number of different symbols behind it. It symbolizes the American dream, blazing your own trail, doing things your own way and still being successful, working with people you love to work with, and all of those other great things that I'm sure he talked about as part of his story yesterday. So that, um, to me, is a great example of good to great and using a story to kind of help get you there. All right, so next I'm gonna talk about something that's a little um, uncomfortable for me, myself. I don't generally talk about myself. I don't um, have a habit of blogging or tweeting or anything. But I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about my own journey over the last year to kind of help exemplify this in action. And so this picture was taken at South by Southwest last year. And I was a creative director for a digital firm that specializes in um, fashion beauty retail. And I was there with my design team. We were having a lovely time. We were living the life. I mean, it's just literally um, quite a, a wonderful position that I've worked hard over 14 years to really attain and, and, um, and live and work. So, so here I am. Uh, about two months after this picture was taken, I got fired from my job. And thus begins my journey. And I wasn't fired for my creative performance, and I wasn't fired because um, I was under-delivering. I was fired because I just didn't get along with the ownership. And um, when I was pushed out of my comfort zone, and that, com that comfort zone um, was everything I had known over 14 years of agency life, suddenly I'm standing there going, I failed. And that's not a feeling that I'm used to feeling. So I'm sort of embracing this, this feeling of failure and I'm uh, thinking through, okay, what, what journey am I gonna take here? What, what are my next steps? Where am I gonna go? I gotta get out of this and stop floundering and make, make something happen. So I decided to start a business. And part of that um, was uh, driven by the fact that I, I just wanted to um, start doing something for myself. And so with that mindset, I thought, I need to change my way of thinking. I need to get out of this failure. I need a drastic change. And so I made a decision to cut off my hair and <laughs> to symbolize this change. And so I went basically from this, I call this my trophy wife picture. <laughs> And this was taken right after I got fired, like the week after I got fired, to this. <laughs> this is the worst picture that's ever happened to me. I'm a little questioning why I even chose it. I mean, it's really big now. This is one of those situations where you're looking at your phone and it's on reverse with the camera and you're like, oh my god. Um, so I just took the picture. But anyway, um, I, so I chopped my hair. I made the decision. I said, uh, uh, this is going to spark this great sort of mindset change. Well, unfortunately, I did it the wrong way. I chose the wrong salon. I <laughs> made an impromptu decision. Um, and so now I have to deal not only with my failure in my profession, but also this lack of confidence in, um, you know, obviously resulting from a really, really bad haircut. So what was I supposed to do? Well, I, so I started this blog and nobody knows about it. It's a, it's a four month thing that I had to do to sort of be very therapeutic um, and just for myself to help myself understand the different obstacles I was running into that were actually paralleling my career and professional challenges with the challenges with my vanity. So I go through this transformation. What obstacles, as it relates to my hair, did I run into? Well, first of all, you cannot do anything with a bad haircut. You can't put it back if you're having a bad hair day. You can't put it in a ponytail. 
you just really have to get out there and own it and hope nobody notices. Obstacle number two, when you wake up in the morning, it looks like this. So um, I, <laughs> I'm laying there in the morning. My children are coming over to my bedside going, Mommy, you got a gooster on your head. And my husband's just like grunting and rolling over until I like sort of get control of that situation. And obstacle three, there's really no good way to look at it. No good way to look at it from behind, from the side, it's sideburns. Um, it was just bad news all around. And so, um, I went through this growth of character and growth of hair over the last 12 months, and I'm here today to be able to laugh about it. But I'm also here to be able to share some lessons learned and some, moral of the st some morals of the story. And lesson number one is never ever make drastic change under duress. Okay? You're, if you're under duress, stop, take a deep breath, sleep on it. Do whatever you gotta do, but do not take action while you're under duress. Number two, go with what you know. I could have gone to the lady at the street, uh, at the end of the street that I've been going to for years that I was happy with, but I had to go to the fancy pants salon across town with a French name with the cool, hip stylist who I thought would give me a good haircut. That was a mistake. And number three, growth comes from hardship. Um, in more ways than one, but this is that whole trite saying, you know, what doesn't kill you make you stronger kind of thing. And so my point in this story is if I were to start this conversation today with those three slides, you might think, okay, that, that's great, you know, she might have, these might be insightful, but what does this mean to me? I really don't care. Um, is she even credible? What's the situation? Well, you know, by ex Expanding upon my journey, I have been able to sort of build credibility for the mistakes that I've made in a very authentic way to come to these conclusions. And hopefully, you, you would believe them more because they're at this point in the conversation versus earlier. So what does this mean to your creative process? Think about your creative process. You step outside of your comfort zone. And complacency kills creativity. So you should always have one foot out of your comfort zone anyway, but you're thrust outside of your comfort zone, you immediately take action and start running into obstacles, you try this, this typeface, you try this gradient, you try this color, and you move things around and you sort of explore a journey um, of design. And then you come back to the client with a result. And, in, and a lesson learned from that, and that is your end recommendation that you share with the client and you say, check this out, doesn't it look cool? And they'll be like, oh, sure, yeah. And then you go through the hardships and the journey, the step-by-step -step journey that you went through to make that happen, and suddenly, it's got more credibility and it's got more value in the mind of the person that you're talking to. And at the very least, if that person does not approve it then and there, then you might revisit parts of your journey in a collaborative way to um, explore another direction to get you to that end return. Creativity is a subjective business, so we have to continually work to sell people in, on an objective um, methodology that can be proven through storytelling. And I encourage you all to kind of use that formula um, as, as you move forward in, in expressing your ideas and convincing people to buy them. So if you do choose to use that formula, I have three techniques for you that I'll finish out uh, this presentation with. Um, that you can infuse within your stories uh, to make them stronger. And the first one is called, um, this is the truth in the details. And I'm going to share with you uh, a little audio clip from Mad Men. And I don't typically watch advertising shows, but I love the show. The character development is just amazing to me. And this is Ben Feldman, and he's the new copywriter on the show this season. He was in a presentation in episode three where he was pitching some business, he sold the business. And then the client comes up to him after he made the sale and said, you know, you really understand our audience. I was really impressed by that. And he actually goes into a story where he's, he's discreetly pitching the idea that he wanted to pitch to begin with. So this is um, Ben Feldman talking for about a minute on his story. Let's see if this works. I have to tell you, young man, you really know women. I've never heard that before. This really gets inside their heads. Well, to tell you the truth, they confuse me. I mean, I keep thinking about Cinderella. We were going to come in here and talk about Cinderella, but it's too 
dark. Really? <laughs> we were kind of hoping for it. Nah, I don't think so. I mean, she's running down this dark side street, and it's outside a castle, so it's got those walls and, and the cobblestones. And, and she's running, but she's only got this one incredible shoe for her incredible gown, so she's hobbling, wounded prey. She can hear him behind her, his measured footsteps catching up. As she turns a corner, those big shadows, and she's scared. And then she, she feels a hand on her shoulder, and she turns around, and it doesn't matter what he looks like. He's handsome at that moment, offering her her shoe. She takes it. She knows she's not safe, but she doesn't care. I guess we know in the end, she wants to be caught. See, it's too dark. Why don't we do that? So you can see how powerful the use of story can be. And then uh, obviously, you know, Don is mad because, you know, he kind of went off the reservation there. But um, details like um, she was prey, she had an incredible dress, you know, big shadows, you know, that really plant the seed of the detail associated with that really go a long way towards establishing that credibility and helping your audience embrace what you're telling them. Have you ever played this game Truth, Truth, Lie? This is a great drinking game, um, and a copywriter of mine introduced it to me a couple years ago, and I used to be terrible at it, and then I started applying this whole truth is in the details technique to it. And basically, it's pretty straightforward. You tell three stories, two, true, two are true and one's a lie, and the person has to guess which one's the lie. And so I always, if I'm dealing with somebody I don't know, I always start out with my stranded stories. So I was stranded on a tropical island in Key West with my girlfriends. I was stranded in the desert with no water and a backpack on my back. Or I was stranded on a boat off of Kelly's Island. Um, so with equal amounts of detail, those three stories have equal weight. But, and I don't have time to kind of go into more detailed stories, but I generally will add more detail to the one that's a lie. And I always win. Uh, so this, this um, one is actually, uh, the lie is the boat story. And I go into detail about, you know, my, my girlfriends, uh, we were going, we were off of Kelly's Island and they were drinking Bud Lights and then the boat stopped and then, you know, motion sickness kicked in and we were all throwing up over the side of the boat and the whole, the whole nine. And um, that's a flat out lie. Um, my friends don't drink Bud Light. <laughs> so uh, this is a great ad that I found. Um, this is a great ad that I found uh, on the best of Craigslist. And if you're having a bad day, man, go on the best of Craigslist and just read. Uh, and it totally lightens up your day. So this is an ad selling a 1995 Pontiac um, Grand Am GT. And you, I'm going to read a couple of, uh, obviously it's very well designed. <laughs> but um, I'm going to read some, some statements within here so you can see the amount of detail that this author is using to really plant this idea in the mind of the audience. I'm going to use my um, uh, sexy lady voice, although I think this would be better read by the guy that does the voiceover on uh, Viagra commercials. If you ever see those commercials, listen to that guy. Okay. Never in your life has a car made you so appealing to the opposite sex. From its provocative curves to the paint job that says, screw you, I'm a car, this five-speed 95 Pontiac emanates manliness from every loosely coupled piece of sheet metal. Every previous owner has had a beard. <laughs> this was the car that broke Pontiac. When it came off the production line, each person in the company had a collective aneurysm from the visual masterpiece with, with which they had blessed humanity and then gave up entirely. And that graph is showing that. Driving, is better, driving this is better than your last four romantic encounters combined. Look at you, you don't even know what to do with yourself right now. Well, take a deep masculine breath and pick up that phone. Once this car is taken, every woman on the planet will pile into it and you'll be SOL. Call Joe. So that's a great idea, uh, or a great example of detail and storytelling that hopefully made this guy sell this car. I love how the captions on all the little sidebar pictures are OMG. OMG, OMG, OMG. 
Okay, so sometimes you don't have time to tell a lengthy story. So you gotta get to the quick as fast as possible. Or maybe your audience isn't engaged with you yet and you just have to pique their interest and get them um, really engaged with what you're talking about. And in that case, tell a mini story. Mini stories are great for headlines, for presentation names. Um, they're great for Twitter. Uh, just any type of small statement that you need um, to communicate a lot in one power-packed punch. And there are three components to a mini story. One is action, two is intrigue, and three is unexpectedness. So if you can pack those three characteristics into one statement, you've got a winning mini story. This is an ad that I did for Keithley Advertising um, about five or six years ago. And this is one of my favorite ads I've ever written. And basically, we were trying to you know, get out there and just like any other agency, to express what we do for our clients. And so we took the tack of getting to the end game as fast as possible and telling those stories in a way that um, was really intriguing. So the headlines are, we've convinced thousands to save the world. We've persuaded men to drop their pants at age 50. We've shown women the way to the fountain of youth. We've compelled students to answer their calling, and we've taught clients how to autograph. We've done all of those things at Keithley Advertising, and it's interesting because people want to know, well, tell me a little bit about this drop your pants thing, like, what's that all about? Well, we had this urology client, and then he was doing prostate testing and all this jazz. So, um, we actually took this and put it on the back of a t-shirt when we did um, the team run for one of the Akron marathons one year, and we had people running behind us, like, trying to read it. And that's how I gauge successful copy. Uh, the next place that many uh, stories can be used is captions. So captions um, are so important. You can't just put a great photo up there and expect people to care about it. You know, give it some personality, put some story behind it. So for this next uh, picture that I posted on Instagram, I used a, a caption. The, the caption was, mustard greens crash the carrot party. And this is the picture. Now imagine if I said, check out our garden. Like, is that engaging? Is it intriguing? No, not necessarily. People interested in gardening might, but I used action. I used a very strong action verb, crashing. I used an intriguing situation that was very unexpected, and therefore I got a higher engagement out of that particular um, post. Another um, thing that I've done for this same client is uh, a very strong headline. This ad right now is running in Scene Magazine for the next week or two. Um, the headline is Bite Me Monsanto. And um, I can get away with this kind of thing with this client because my husband owns the business. Uh, <laughs> and this was really where he wanted to go with it. And really what, I, what we're hoping to achieve, and that we have achieved on a minimal level, is um, not just, hey, we've got happy hour from four to seven, because everybody says that. But we want to build a story behind this new brand to ultimately build equity in it over time. Um, we're very obviously into farm to table and all that jazz. So, um, you know, we are hoping that this will pique interest enough to get people to go to thespiceblog.com and learn more about why Monsanto should bite us. When you're dealing with weighty topics a lot of times, it's important to pepper that with some unexpected lightheartedness in your, in your storytelling, especially if you're dealing with a client over time. So, um, you know, I uh, m always make a point to use different types of techniques in mini stories. You know, in this case, I used the caption, guess what, which linked to this. Chicken pie. <laughs> Whoever's doing the um, WMC tweeting today, can you put that on the record? <laughs> guess what, chicken butt. So, um, this is just an example of like people expect the same thing again and again. Guess what? We have news. We're doing this. We're doing that. Well, you know, sometimes it's not all about us. And here's an unexpected way to pique interest and build equity. Um, lastly, and I'm uh, sort of running at the end of my time here, but I've got two or three more slides. Um, Turn to before, after, and most of you guys are, are visual experts in this room, so this should be very easy for you. The um, before, after tells that story but skips, makes the transformation part with all those obstacles in it implied. So when you have a very strong before, after scenario, you can tell an entire story in two pictures. 
Um, I've used this technique for a multi-million dollar campaign I did for GE Lighting. Um, I used transformative language, transform bleak to eco chic kind of thing, before, after. And that, that was the whole theme behind the campaign because we were attempting to convince people that they needed to start thinking about decorating with light and not just using it when you had to change a light bulb. Um, here's another example of that. I've also seen it used, um, this before, after, very, very successfully and powerfully in public service announcements. I don't know if you guys have seen this uh, latest campaign called Faces of Meth that's been on the news lately a lot. And um, basically, uh, they um, partnered with a police station, I think in Portland, that took mug shots of people over the course of their meth attic career. So um, this might have been taken five years ago, and this woman has been arrested like 20 times since, and here's where she is today. This tells a story, um, you know, and unfortunately, we don't, I, I don't have any um, expectation of this woman getting to that return part where she shares her life lessons that she's learned, but if she were to do so, wouldn't that be an excellent documentary or a great book to read because she has that story? And I kind of want to know what's in the middle there. Um, I've worked with a lot of plastic surgery clients over the years. And every time we go into brand their uh, practices and do their websites, um, consistently the top one or two, one, two or three well, most trafficked pages are the before after pages. To the point where I was like, why should we even write copy? Um, let's just put a bunch of before afters up there. Because people just sometimes want to cut to the chase and you've got to pique their attention very quickly and you don't have time for that. Transfer, transformation type of story. So that's it. Um, uh, I hope that you've learned something uh, in the last 30 minutes, and I certainly enjoyed talking to you about um, something that I'm very passionate about, so thank you for listening. <laughs>